Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, and as much as we all love video games, it is important to remember that the gaming industry is a business first and foremost, with publishers' primary occupation being to part you with as much of your hard-earned money as humanely possible. And so, the industry as a whole has developed a wide range of tricks to manipulate gamers, aka consumers, into throwing their cash their way. As companies continue to prove, there are very few lows to which they won't stoop to in order to turn a profit, exploiting the psychological vulnerabilities of players to milk them for every available penny. So let's take a look at some of these tactics today, in the hopes that we can better understand them so that we can avoid them in the future. With this in mind, I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 manipulative gaming tactics you fall for every bloody time. Number 10. Suspiciously Impressive Trailers and Bullshots one of the gaming industry's oldest tricks is to lure potential customers in with misleading target gameplay and screenshots, or rather, bullshots is what they term it as, which ultimately aren't representative of what the final game actually looks like. The most infamous example in the last generation was unquestionably Watch Dogs, which ended up receiving a substantial visual downgrade from its original E3 demo, much to players' disappointment. Before that, we had Killzone 2's PS3 air quotes tech demo, which wasn't even in-engine, but rather a rendered video intended to approximate what the team at Guerrilla Games was aiming for. In recent years, it's turned out out that this was originally an internal video never meant to be released outside of Sony, but once the marketing bods had feasted their eyes upon it, they actively attempted to manipulate players into believing that those visuals were a realistic prospect on the PS3. And today, developers are still trying to get away with over-promising a visual experience which isn't actually feasible on existing hardware. So to be clear, always be skeptical of early gameplay footage, because it is so rarely going to represent the vision that ends up on our screens. Number 9. The Promise of No Microtransactions there has been considerable pushback against publishers in recent years who littered their games with microtransactions right out of the box, and so it's been a cause for celebration when a game's release with the promise of no such nonsense at launch comes about. But as become clear as of late, for many games this is nothing more than PR lip service, with publishers ultimately plugging microtransactions in a few weeks later after all of the positive reviews have dropped and people have decided to buy the game. Take Crash Team Racing Nitro Refuel which saw Activision add microtransactions to the game a month after release despite initially promising it would have no such feature. While Fallout 76 initially promised its microtransactions wouldn't be paid to win, only for more recent updates to contradict that heavily. Hell, after reviewers criticised EA for Star Wars Battlefront 2's microtransaction implementation, many publishers simply decided to hide these costs from critics that were playing it in the pre-release period. Because, I mean, screw transparency, right? Ultimately, if a game seems monetizable, it almost certainly will be. And even if the publisher claims that the game won't ever have loot boxes or any money-spinning tosh, you're best taking their comments with a truckload of salt. Number 8. Bigger Worlds Equal Better Worlds the last generation of gaming has all been about open worlds, where games have tended to sell their teeming locales on the proud promise that they're larger than the maps that came before. No publisher is more guilty of this than Ubisoft, which relishes wowing players with the ever-expanding map sizes in series such as Assassin's Creed and Far Cry under the pretense that bigger is automatically always better. And yet, many complained that Assassin's Creed Odyssey in particular featured an excessively huge map which proved more exhausting than fun to actually explore, especially given that Ubisoft lazily resorted to bloating the map out with busy work icons rather than genuinely interesting curated content. But the fact that these games continue to pull gangbusters business suggests that players always have and likely always will be easily lured in by a gigantic sandbox, even if vast swathes of this are completely uninteresting. Number 7. The Pull of a Cinematic Trailer there surely isn't a player among us who hasn't been swayed by a beautifully crafted cinematic trailer. Once again, our friends at Ubisoft are probably the industry's most common culprits, usually introducing the latest entry to the Assassin's Creed franchise with a glossy cinematic trailer that shows not a single bloody scrap of actual bloody gameplay. Nothing, however, tops the legendarily manipulative trailer for zombie-themed action RPG Dead Island, which implied a far more visceral and emotional game than the relatively generic 
generic zombie actioner that we ended up with. Now, there's nothing wrong with admiring cinematic trailers as works of art in their own right, but if you expect them to fundamentally reflect the gameplay experience itself, you're going to have a bad time more often than not. Number 6. Dev Maths and the Art of Estimated Playtimes so, dev maths is one of the oldest tricks in the book, whereby in the pre-release interviews, developers will be asked about their game's length and they emphatically state an over-the-odds playtime. News outlets will then uncritically run with this claim like it's the gospel, and so too will players, forgetting that developers of course have a vested interest to exaggerate how long a game might actually take you. Insomniac Games claimed that their PS4 Spider-Man campaign would last 20 hours without side content, when in reality, even leisurely players could beat it within about 12 to 15 hours. Now that's just one example. The director behind A Way Out claimed that his cinematic adventure would last 6 to 8 hours when in actuality it lasted around 5. Now everyone plays games at a different pace, but it's clear in examples like this that developers are exaggerating the average playtime to make their titles seem more value-filled than they actually are. It makes sense from a business perspective, deceptive though it is, and so in order to manage expectations and avoid disappointment, players should assume that any stated playtime has been exaggerated by at least one third. Number 5. Hollow Marketing Buzzwords more so than any other media industry, video games are absolutely obsessed with fancy buzzwords which can be used to sell games to players. We've heard how so many games are cinematic and emotional experiences, how open-world games are reliant on emergent and procedural gameplay, and in the case of Crackdown 3, how it's apparently going to harness the power of the cloud. What the hell does that even mean? And you know what, while not all marketing spiel is total nonsense because yes, ray tracing is definitely a thing and it is amazing, too often PR firms are hard to try and entice players with an apparent new hotness that doesn't actually exist. Often these words are simply an attempt to try and cover up for an actual lack of imagination in the game itself, and clearly, it works. Number 4. The FOMO Factor No other art form exploits the FOMO phenomenon, that is, the fear of missing out, quite like video games. Given that gaming is now an inherently social medium in the age of multiplayer, open world and live service titles, it's easier than ever for publishers to make players feel like they're missing out on something special which needs to be played right now. With live service games offering up events, challenges and rewards which now exist within a strict time window, players are incentivized to invest early and keep coming back week after week or even day after day. That's not to ignore all the artificially scarce collector's item nonsense or worse still, gay desirable content behind specific retailers such as Call of Duty Black Ops 3's Nuketown map which was only available initially to UK players who bought the title from the retailer game. All in all, game publishers are exploiting basic human psychology in an attempt to compel players to part with their money, prodding the impulse receptors in a way that's far more insidious than many will ever want to accept. Number 3. Games are made for you it will always be in a publisher's interest to foster a relationship with a player which superficially appears to transcend its obviously transactional nature, that is, making you like the company as more than a mere entertainment vendor. Companies will often do this by using an approachable, likeable public figure to serve as a bridge between players and the company, such as Nintendo's Reggie or Microsoft's Phil Spencer. But as much as these figureheads may often insist that games are made for us, it's important to never forget that video games have and always will be a commercial enterprise first and foremost. This isn't to say that enormous artistic toil doesn't go into making most great video games, but when Sony makes the claim that they're for the players, they're really only doing whatever is in their best interest. Hence why they took so damn long to allow cross-play functionality on the PS4, for example. That wasn't for the players. The bottom line is that these companies are actively invested in making you see them as more than just a monolithic enterprise, but never lose sight of the fact that everything a company does is in the pursuit of financial prosperity. Number 2. Crowdfunding and early access as excuses for mediocrity Though it would be unfair to tar all crowdfunded and early access games with the same brush, the sheer abundance of unrealized or unsatisfying games to emerge from these development models speaks for itself. Crowdfunding in particular, where games won't necessarily go into production until they reach a certain financial milestone, has often resulted in desperate fans throwing money at developers who, in the end, fail to produce a satisfactory product. Perhaps the most infamous example of this is Mega Man's highly anticipated spiritual successor, Mighty No. 9. 
Online, which after receiving $4 million in crowdfunding, released to a whimper of a response from fans and critics alike. And so, while crowdfunding can lead to great games, it often simply is just an avenue for developers to cynically exploit their fan base, asking them to hand over cash before the game's even been bloody made. And number one, we'll do better next time. Tying into the argument that game companies want you to relate to them on a human level, they're also not above trying to toy with your emotions and exploiting your trusting demeanor where their mistakes are concerned. We've all sat through cringeworthy corporate apologies where companies such as EA and Bethesda have attempted to smooth over troubled launches by, I don't know, promising that they'll do better next time. After fans vocally complained that Star Wars Battlefront was severely lacking in content, EA promised that the sequel would be decidedly more content rich, offering up a single player campaign and even lacking a season pass. Except, as we all eventually learned, the campaign was, well, pretty dull and the game's microtransaction controversy made it clear that EA was only interested in appearing to do better rather than actually committing to the courage of their convictions. In short, it's always smart to cast a skeptical eye on companies rebounding from a recent kerfuffle, because it's highly probable that their response has been carefully crafted by a team of PR reps, if not also their lawyers. Real redemption is possible, of course, as Hello Games proved with their No Man's Sky terrific turnaround, but this is far more of an outlier than the industry wants you to believe. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 manipulative gaming tactics that you fall for every time. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. If you want to chat to me further about all things to do with video games, TV, film, whatever else, you can do so over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero. Or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice. It's my personal gaming channel where I stream every single Wednesday and Sunday. It'd be great to see you over there. But before I go, my friend, I just want to say one thing. In life, we too can fall to our own mental manipulative tactics and convince ourselves ourselves that we are not worth love or happiness or deserve success. But you know what, my friend, you deserve all of those three things and then some, and you should treat yourself fairly both mentally and physically. And do not let anyone or anything else put you down or make you feel less than who you are. Because as I've said many times over, you are a big bloody ledge. That's the truth. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.